establish the mood. They use that expression, establish the mood. Now, if a fellow has a certain mood he's going to do, like this pickup, if he's going to pick the cards up, you know, with a sweep like this, he's going to pick them up that. Now, in other words, if he, if he just pick, if I just come up and pick the cards up suddenly like that and deal, well, it looks suspicious. But every time I, I pick up the cards, I do this, and I establish that way of picking them up. Now, you get accustomed to that. Now, when I do the phony move, you're, but if I suddenly pick up cards like this, and then suddenly do this. So you've got to establish the move. When you're tossing the broads, as they call it, tossing, this means tossing the cards. You see, when you throw the three cards down, the, the, we have what they call shills or boosters, confederates working in the audience. Well, they themselves can't follow the card when it's thrown by a clever operator. So the operator has to tip them off or show them where the card is. So during his spiel, so-called uh, when he's making the remarks about tossing the cards, he always said, 10 gets you 20, 20 gets you 40, or some such thing. But when he, now, supposing the card's over on the right-hand side, the expression for that is over on 40. But if I say, all right, 10 gets you 20, 20 gets you 40, over on 40, that over on, as soon as you hear over on 40, that means the card is here. If you say over on 10, that's over on the left side. And if you say make no over, no over at all. I think it comes from office. I mean, really, it's like giving the office, you might say. But anyway, that's the, they, they have ways of, of warning you, of telling the, the Confederate where the card is. Otherwise, he'd be at a loss to know where it was himself, and he couldn't make the proper bet. Uh, probably, uh, from what I've, the little I've read, uh, as much money has changed hands in uh, uh, America's history with three-card money, I guess. Oh, yes, the shell else. game, the shell, well, that's why they're so notorious. The shell game and three-card money, even in the New York subways, of the, well, when I left New York, there were still, uh, sometimes late in the morning, three or four in the morning in the New York subways, you'd see three or four fellows gathered around a little crowd, fleecing some poor fellow out of money. That's and they, they did. It's incredible that after all the exposure and the warnings not to play another man's game, that there was always somebody that's... Yeah. And it's that Cuban wanting to get something for nothing. Yeah. If they'd be honest and not try, strive to get something for nothing, they wouldn't be in any danger of being Well, of course, a three-card money also has the uh, advantage of being so uh, incredibly visual. Yes. It's they really a it, visual yeah, trick. they do. Especially uh, when they put, they call it putting the corner on, a bent corner. Yeah, would you, they uh, call would it you, putting would the you, log on. Would you toss a... Uh, yeah, they call uh, it putting the log on. We could see maybe they call it the, putting the log on. Uh, putting the lug on? Yeah, the lug is the corner. That's what they call Oh, yes, right. A bent corner. Well, I'll just illustrate corner, that. Right. I'll just illustrate that. I did this on the Paris television. They call this Bonneton in, in Paris. That's the name for three-card money. Now, they always bend the cards this way so that uh, they're easy to give you a facility in picking the cards up from the table. And they always say, a little game from Hanky Poo, black for me, the red for you, $10 gets you 20, 20 gets you 40. You think I was a professional the way I spit it out. I've done this since I was a kid, fooling the boys at school. Now, here's the idea, you tell them to watch the queen. Now I can throw them down like that, and of course the queen can go over there, or I can throw them the same way and cross my hand, the queen goes in the center. But if I throw the cards like this, you see, and show you the queen, and then show you that this is black and this is black, you naturally think this is the queen, but that's black also. You see, that's always black, and this is always black, and this is always black, and the queen is there. Now, that's very ambiguous. I mean, most people can't follow that. But the average person is afraid to bet on another man's game. So what happens? They have a confederate in the audience, and this fellow bets on the wrong card. He throws the card aside. When I stoop to pick it up, the confederate bends the corner of the card up like that, and he covers it over. He covers the card over. Now, I come back and I say, listen, mister, don't throw my cards around like that. They get all dirty and spotted, and anybody can pick the card out. I pretend not to notice this bent corner at all. Now, so I throw the cards like this. I, I throw the queen, I throw them. It looks as if it went over there, but this, the, the shill puts his hand over. He says, I'll bet you 100 on this, 100 on this, or what, $50, whatever it is. And of course, he wins. And now these timid individuals standing around see this bent corner, so they think, well, this is an easy game. So here's the way he works. He says, now remember, gentlemen, that's black. He says, this is black. And he says, this is the queen. He pretends not to notice the corner. He throws it over like that, throws it over like that. Now he crosses his hands this way. And of course, the shell again covers this. He says, 100 on this, 100. And all the suckers come in. And I'm very sorry because that's black, and this is black, and the queen is over there. See, so there's no chance to beat, uh, beat this man. I mean, you got to. That's beautiful. It's trying to get something yeah. for nothing, you, yeah. you lose your shirt. So yeah. don't try to get something for nothing.
the one thing that I loved was New York, because I used to read a great deal when I was young, and it seemed that all the novelists, the painters, the sculptors, the artists, the actors, they all sooner or later something in New York, at Sherry's or one of the great, they'd meet, you know, somewhere in New York, and New York had a fascination for me. Not so much for the city alone, but for the people that, that I used to read and visit and congregated there. And they do say that if you stand on the corner of 42nd and 5th Avenue, that long enough you'll meet every celebrity in the world. Here I am, a young fellow from Canada, came down to the biggest city in the world, and I got recognition from the greats, I mean, in New York. And I always had a love late late. I never copied anything consciously, but when he called himself the international card expert, I, I thought, well, I can be the New York card expert. Yeah, what's a nice word, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'm better than a magician. Yeah, but it's a nice word. But anyway, the nice part of the international, the, 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 the New York card expert, uh, people who used to sometimes meet people and think I was a bridge expert, or, uh, yeah. or you know, yeah. I, I could talk yeah. on bridge, I could use it. I could say, well, I, if I didn't want to say I, I did magic, I could say, well, I'm an expert on card, on bridge, and I say any game you want to name, or something like that, you know, but yeah. it could cover uh, different. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I know in reading back on some of the old, uh, uh, the old Jinx uh, publications, that uh, uh, I would occasionally come across a, uh, an article where uh, uh, your name was mentioned in those days. I guess this would be uh, well, it's funny. the 30s. I, I, the rule, I avoided getting my name mentioned. But it's well, I mean, just uh, in, yeah. the, in, the, in the trivia, uh, yeah. kind of, you yeah, know, what's happening, yeah. and kind of uh, in magic. And I know occasionally I'd run across where, you know, Di Vernon is, uh, is now at the such and such room of the yeah. ho so hotel so and so, you know. And uh, this was probably in the 30s, I yeah, guess, okay. back in the 30s. And was that a, uh, was it, was, was there a lot of that going on? In other no. words, were there a lot of house magicians? No, in those days? no, no. I think that, uh, you see, Billy Rose really started. There wasn't a single magician working in any, except in theaters in Vaudeville, you know. But when Billy Rose opened his casino to Paris, uh, he put in, uh, you know, a fortune teller, a sketch artist, and a magician in, to work intimately. And that's what started. Well, I started with Billy Rose. And then I went to the Madison, and then after that they started putting magicians. But I was really a pioneer in that field. I see. Uh, Although it, Chicago had before, now, Chicago had some before that. Yeah, no, th that was really working the restaurants and, yeah, and yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the dinner, yeah. the dinner crowd. Yeah, the close, close up, close up, up magic. Effect, yeah. 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 And uh, uh, people like Bert Allard. They Allard's. had in New York, yeah, yeah. Bert Allard later yeah. worked in yeah. Chicago. Yeah. Chicago and Bert. That was later. Yeah. 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 Chicago's always been a mecca yeah. for uh, That's right, Chicago has. Yeah. Chicago at one time had 18 different uh, uh, restaurants and bistros and speakeasies with were yeah. Yeah. 18 different places. New York never had more than five at the most. Talking about Johnny Scarney, when here I am in the New York hospital, with a cast completely right down both, just my fingers. A cast went right down to my fingers, and a big, heavy plaster cast. And everybody that come in, they used to autograph. They used to autograph with a pencil or a pen on this plaster cast. And these arms are really quite decorated with all these autographs. But I had as many once on Saturday. I had 60 magicians come in to see me, That's great. and they all autographed the damn arm. Well, these things were something, you know. I'll never forget when Johnny Scarney walked in the auction. Well, he said, just want to show you. Now. He said, fellows like you and me should go to work. And then not <laughs> much of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just goes to show you, you're punished for going to a, work. It's a personal He goes like you and me. He always declared, <laughs> yeah. what Johnny, yeah. I, I he, tended to he tell really you. He really identified with Yeah, you, I you intended think. to yeah. tell you this, a who's on Frank. Yeah. Every time I'm with Johnny and he's sitting with a bunch of, here's a right, only a fart short time ago. He said, right in the castle here, not so many weeks ago, up at the upstairs bar there. He said, oh, a whole lot of magicians all standing around. He said, well, he said, Di and I are 50 years ahead of all you jerks. He said that one for a minute. Di and I are ahead. I said, Johnny, please don't know what the clear be. And I said, you're the, you, you are, not me. Yeah, yeah, you know, now, what are you talking about? You're my pal, ain't you? You know, you go to, you're, we're 50 years ahead of everybody. But he always tells everybody. And I, I but when he's alone, he doesn't. But when he's with me, he always, I said, Johnny, please, let me talk about it. Don't tell him. You know, and there's one interesting thing that, uh, in our days, See, Erdnays has a very good description of streetcar money, incidentally, but there's one interesting thing in Erdnays. Erdnays talks about, you know, the backhand palm. He talks about this palm. He said, he said, this has very little use except as an exhibition of dexterity to show up and But he says, however, on one occasion, it got us out of a 
very serious situation. However, this is another story. And this worried me as a kid about 12 years old. How could this get you out of a difficult situation? And I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And then years later, when I came down to New York, there's a statute in the law in New York that if you're caught throwing three-card money in a public place, it's a $100 fine and I forget, months of jail or something. If you're caught really? gambling for money in any public place in New York with three-card money, it's written right there. So I thought, is it possible that uh, they had this law and her name was caught with three cards and the, and the judge said, well, what are you doing with those three cards? You might have said, well, judge, look, I'll show you what I do. I thought that's one possibility. <laughs> and I thought another possibility is that, that he had a card palm in his hand and some guy stuck a gun. He said, up in your hand. I met a fellow named Perkins from Lexington, Kentucky. And he was one of the greatest guys palming cards for a gambler. He, he could use his hand perfectly normally with a card palm. Tie his tie, drink, eat, write, do anything. And yeah, I wanted to learn some things from him, and he wouldn't. He was a gambler. He wouldn't talk. And I he said, what do you want to do tricks for? And I said, well, for fun. You know, what fun do you get out of it? You make any money out of it? I said, well, you get money for entertaining somebody. Well, why don't you learn to play cards for a living? You make a fortune. What do you want to bunk around with that stuff? I said, that's the kind of guy. What do you want? I don't like care about tricks. What do you want to fool people? Told Charlie, too. What do you want to do that stuff for? What do you mean? Well, Dad, I make a couple of thousand dollars when I do my tricks. What are you doing with that? What are you talking about? I can play cards for 10 minutes and make more than you were making a month. You know, that's the way you talk. You have to talk. But anyway, I wanted him to show me. He wouldn't tip, you know, he wouldn't say anything. So he said, I tell you, he said, if you can show me how to, because gamblers always bomb this bomb. See, they never, they never bomb. Very seldom. They always bomb in this, you know. Yeah, they always have the Yeah, 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 yeah so the hand is always a natural uh, Yeah, I think. Well, anyway, now he said, I want it. He said, I want it. He said, when a card, he says, when a card is, uh, is over over on this side. He said the deck is over here. He said I can you know I can say all right your deal and, and get rid of this card. But he said if the deck's over here, he said I can't come over here with my hand and get rid of the card. He said if you can show me a way how to get the card from this hand into this hand unobserved. He said I'll show you anything you want to know. This guy said. So I went back. I was living right here in California. This is about 20 years ago. I was living in the uh, in Charlie Miller El Vigo Apartments where Charlie Miller lived. I had the top floor there. But anyway, I was living there, and I was waiting for Charlie to come in. I was sitting there thinking, how the hell can you get a card from this hand into the other? Bring your hand this way, bring it this way. How, how can you naturally bring your hands together? I thought, you can bring them together this way, you can bring them together this way. But how could you transfer that card? And I really was trying, no, you can't do that. Or you could rub your hands together, what can you do? So, anyway, this is absolutely true. I suddenly looked at the time, because it was getting late, and I put my hand like that. And I thought, that's a position I never thought of, see? So, see, this move is almost perfect. This, so I, I came up with this move, see, if I, I mean, for instance, I could say, well, we've only got about three minutes more to play, see? See, but it's a natural move. Look, I mean, I say, well, we've only got about three minutes more to play, and I can get it. But this move, see, even from the side, from the side, so you can't yeah. be seen, see. But anyway, he That's loved beautiful. that move. He said, this, I can use this. He said, he, put, he shook hands with yeah. me. And he yeah. said, where'd you get that? I said, that fell over last night. Great, great. Now what do you want to learn? He showed me some things. But as I say, these, this is like absolutely occurred yeah. just like I'm telling you. I mean, yeah. by accident. This is a very interesting thing. That ideas, just like this occurred to me. I don't know whether this has happened with you. An idea suddenly hits you just like this. An idea hits you like that. You can work and work and work and nothing happens, but suddenly just hits you like that. But as I say, I know these ideas don't hit you unless you've done a lot of groundwork. Nothing, you're just like you go plateau, plateau, everybody knows yeah, that, well, of learning. But sometimes an idea hits you, but it will not hit you if you haven't done that pioneer you have work. To do the, you, have you have to do the homework. You have to do the homework. <laughs> Many years ago when I was in Nashville, North Carolina, a man named John C. Sprong, long passed away, much older than I was, he wrote to me in Asheville and said, there's a rumor that out west somewhere there's a man who can deal from the middle of the pack. And nobody had ever heard of such a thing, I mean, dealing from the middle. Now it's a trite phrase among magicians, but at that time nobody had ever heard of dealing from the middle of the pack. And he wrote to me and said to me, Vernon, he said, if you, you're traveling around the country cutting these silhouettes, he said, if you ever get out west and you can trace down this gambler, he said, I'm willing to pay $100 for any information at all about the man. He said, I don't expect, just give me any information about him. I'd be willing to send $100.
I wrote to Sprong, I said, Sprong, I'd be just as anxious to meet him as you would. <laughs> you don't have to send me any hundred dollars. But anyway, to cut a long story short, I was in, uh, uh, in St. Joseph, Missouri. No, I'm sorry. This was in Kansas City. Because I was West Fawcett Ross, who so lives in St. Joseph, Missouri. I was in Kansas City, and we were sitting one day talking, and the jailer from the local hotel called up Fawcett, and he said, Fawcett, he says, you're interested in this sleight of hand. He says, we've got a fellow in jail here, a Mexican, and he says, he's very wonderful with the cards. Would you like to come over and see him? So uh, this was on a Sunday. So he said, he said hey, uh, when they're having chapel, I'll have them come into my office and he'll show you a few things with cards. He's been astounding all the inmates of the prison here. He said, we have him on a stabbing charge. He won money gambling, and he said, the fellas chased him out to take the money away from him in the alley, and he stabbed a man, and he's up on a murder charge, and if this man dies, he'll be a murder charge, but if the man gets better, it'll just be a case of assault. So anyway, we went over to cut a long story short, we went over to the, to the jail to see this fellow, and he wasn't so good, but he was good enough to astound the, the sheriff, you know. But in talking to him, I asked him, I said, have you ever heard of anybody be able to deal the cards from the middle of the deck? And this Mexican said, well, yes, he says, I see you. In, in Kansas City, I, I seen I see this man do this. And this was the first information or clue I had. So all I knew it was around Kansas City. So I went to Kansas City with Charlie Miller. I took Charlie Miller, who was visiting at the time. And I asked all over in pool rooms and gambling dens and everywhere if they knew anything about a man who deal from the center of the deck, a mechanic. And all these wise guys, they, they looked at me and said, it's hard enough to get the second card. What are you talking about, deal from the center? What mail order catalog you've been reading? And they, they made ridicule the idea. Well, anyway, I persisted, and finally I found out from old man Lee, who was, worked for the Kansas City Card Company, that, they, that he thought that there might be a man in Pleasant Hill, a little town outside of Kansas City. Well, anyway, I went to Pleasant Hill. I drove over, it was about 70 miles from Kansas City, and I inquired all over town. I thought if there was a notorious gambler around, he must be known. I even went into the bank and asked tellers, and I went to gasoline stations. Couldn't find out anything, and Charlie Miller got disgusted and came back, but I stuck it out. Well, finally, I went back, hopeless. I thought there's no chance, but I'm going to try it again. So a couple of weeks later, I drove all the way back again and drove over to Pleasant Hill. And, and the funny thing, I was sitting in my car, and I was thinking, well, I'm going to give up this quest because I'll never find this man. And I suddenly saw a little girl, a little grubby little girl, about six years old, munching on an ice cream cone. And she she just come to the end of the cone, and she looked very sad that the ice cream was all gone. She was sucking it out of the bottom of the cone. So I said, little girl, come here. And she was very shy. She wouldn't come over. And I thought, well, her parents have told her not to talk to strange men or something. I said, no, come here. And she wouldn't come over. So I took a dime out of my pocket, and I threw it over to her. I said, buy another cone. I threw the cone, and oh, she was so grateful. She took the dime, and she went right out in the store and bought it a cone. And she started munching on it again, standing there looking at me. And I said, little girl, do you know, uh, oh, I knew that by this time I'd learned the man's name, Kennedy, Bill Kennedy. He must be dead. I said, don't mention his name. I said, do you know where a man named Bill Kennedy lives? He said, he lives up on that white house on top of the hill. And I remember thinking at the time, a little child shall guide them. No, but it's true, this little girl. <laughs> and I thought, this is impossible. But sure enough, I drove up to the top of the hill and knocked on the door and this, Rather grubby looking guy came to the door and, and I said, are you Mr. Kennedy? He said, yes, Bill Kennedy. And I, the first remark I made to him, I said, I heard about you on the Atlantic. And he looked, he says, what? I said, I heard about you on the Atlantic. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, I, I play cards on the ships. I lie, uh, perjury. And I said, I play cards. And I said, I heard about you on the ship. He says, you did? He says, come in, come in. And he called to his wife, he says, Madge, I've forgotten her name. He says, get the table ready. He says, get a stack of cards on the table. Well, he called me in, and he was, I could see, he was just like a little boy. He said, how could I get a, on a ship to play cards? He says, could a rough fellow like me get on in fast company like that? He said, I could win thousands of dollars if I could get on a ship. And I told him, you could pose as an Oklahoma oil man or something. I said, no, <laughs> no problem at all. I said, well, anyway, I played a part, and I got the information out. That's the story of how I met this little Kennedy. It's a long and, story. and he really, but I mean, he was. Oh yeah, he really exactly. Yeah, exactly. I tell you, the bit, one of the big thrills. I only had several thrills of magic in my life. Uh, he, when the first thing he showed me is he took the cards, and he said, uh, "Sit down." And I sat opposite this table. He took a pack of cards, and he took three kings out, and he put them on the bottom of the pack. 
And he said, now cut the packet. I cut the pack of cards. And he said, now, uh, he said, now, he said, how many hands will I deal out? And I said, I don't care. He said, well, how many? I said, six. So he dealt out six hands, and stud poker, and he turned up the cards, and when he dealt, when he dealt my card, my card that fell face up was a king. And I thought, my God, he must have dealt that from the center of the deck, because I cut the card right to the center. So then I said, go ahead. And he, and he dealt another one that came face up, and I said, my God, I, it looked perfectly normal to me, you know. And I said, Go ahead. I thought you, you, you got the other one in the hole. In other words, he'd already dealt me one in the hole. That was the biggest thrill that I didn't realize that he'd even. Well, anyway, so my hand immediately went to my pocket. I had about $60 in my pocket, and I was trying to separate a $20 bill or a $10 bill. I thought, I'll give him $50 if he'll give me any information on this. I was looking down like this, and, and I thought, perhaps I've got something that will interest him. So then I went into a few things that I do, and he became fascinated, and he traded me, and, you know, that's how I met him. That's a true story. Did you? Did you? No, 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 I'm talking about the cut. I mean, you know, this might be interesting. I mean, you know, see this book, Herd Maze, you were talking about. Now, of course, there, there's been more thought on, on circumventing the cut. When cards are cut, naturally, they're, they're cut. But the gambler has to bring them back. Now, there are many ways of cutting cards with one hand. Now, of course, this movement is wide open. You can see that. But gamblers reach across for their cigar or something. Under cover of reaching for their cigar, they cut the card. Well, they can be cut that way, they can be cut this way, they can be cut, they can be cut this way, they can be cut this way, they can be cut this way, they can be cut this way. And I've got 30 different ways of cutting a pack of cards. 30 different, 30 different. 30 different variations. O open and closed. Open and closed, yeah. Right. You see an illustration, when, when cards are cut, I'll put the card face up on top of the pack. Now see, when cards are cut, naturally they're cut like this, and these go on top of these. But but the way some gamblers do, of course, this doesn't look right because the cards are face up. But when the cards are cut like this, you see, they're cut. Now, these should go on top of those, but they pick them up with a sliding motion. I'll do that again. Pick them up with a sliding motion. See, instead of going on top, they go underneath. Now, some, that's a quick move, but sometimes gamblers want to see it done slowly, so they pick the cards up like that. Now, that card is really in the center, but by a maneuver like that, they bring it back to the top. So there are many different ways of, of doing these things. I mean, which is too technical to go into. Finding a, uh, finding a card, uh, uh, finding a card uh, blindly in the deck. Have you known a man or two who could, uh, uh, could who could do it? Uh, oh yes, uh, this man, this man Stevens, I was talking Stevens, about before. Uh -huh. he, he, he did ph phenomenal things in three or four shuffles. He could get three or four cards together at the top of the pack that he needed for to make up a good hand. And he did it with absolute I would think of beauty, I mean, as far as skill is concerned, like a masterful pianist or surgeon doing So he would quickly pick out yeah, one, yeah. two, whatever. So I'd yeah. call the cards, they call it culling. And uh, he would call uh, a number of cards with, uh, what, two shuffles, three yes, shuffles? Yes, yes, And of course, as I say, it's possible, you know, by, by judging, uh, for instance, if, uh, a skilled man with cards can cut off exactly 19 cards, or he can cut off exactly 11, or by sense of touch, it's hard to believe I that this facility. It it's like, well, it's like, uh, it's like playing a harmonic on the violin. It has to be a very sensitive touch. In other words, as I remember an old manual training teacher in school when I was a kid told us that a, a man with a needle point could work almost as fine as a finest micrometer by the natural sense of judgment with his eye, which is, is true to a certain extent because there are girls who count paper to 200 sheets at a time. They can infallibly, from a big stack of paper, just riffle and pick off exactly 200 sheets. In fact, I've seen them do it many times. They never miss. But this is a facility which can be, it's remarkable how these things can be trained. Now, if you, of course, it's, not, it's very difficult to cut off 20 and then cut off 25 and 26, but you can train yourself to cut off a certain amount and you feel in your hand the, the sense of feel, the touch, and the sight combined to make a perfect estimation. The way they used to do in the old days, a man would go into a drugstore and a busy in a neighborhood, if he's going to play cards in a certain neighborhood, he'd go in and he'd buy a carton of cards, because they usually come a dozen packs in a carton, and he'd buy a dozen packs of cards. He'd say, we're going on a fishing trip, and I'd like a dozen, we're going to play a lot of poker, I'd like a dozen packs of cards. Well, he buys the pack, and that night he goes home with his accomplice, and they sit up all night marking all the cards and resealing them, which they resealed them again with the wax and everything very carefully done. 
And they, then the next day he goes back and he says to the clerk in the store, he says, one of my friends died who was going on this fishing trip and we postponed the trip. And he says, I can't really use these cards. He said, I know, I don't suppose you'll take them back, but I'll get, we'll give, you, give, you, give them for half price. You can resell them. Well, they'll take them back. They'll give them back to the man. But they give, now these cards are in there marked. And now when they play cards, they say, well, there's a drugstore in the corner. Get a pack of cards. Well, naturally, they've got this card in the cards. And so they're not. Well, that's the kind of thing yeah. they do. So the, yeah. the man will swear they couldn't have been prepared because he bought them at the corner drugstore. But this happened not only with one card. In fact, I've seen this happen in the last couple of years in Vegas. I, I was up in Vegas, yeah, and I saw, I saw a fellow doing this very thing in a drugstore in Vegas. He went in and he had three cards. And he said, we were going on a trip, but he said, one of my friends died. And he said, I can't use these cards. And the fellow gave him a third of the price for three cartons of card. Well, I knew darn well. I, I was there when the conversation was soon. Of course, he has to hope that he's going to come across those someplace. Yeah, something. oh, sure. Yeah. He recognized yeah. them. Why do we got a little yeah, separate sure. mark on the case? Yeah. Yeah. So he knows they're his car. <laughs> so, I mean, he's perfectly so, uh, innocent as far as... Uh, uh, tricks haven't changed too much. No, that's <laughs> like... I guess Watergate knows a lot of these things. Yeah, right, yeah, right. right, right. Yeah, that's, that's the way they have. They're all kinds of schemes. I mean, so you can't... When a man vouches, he says, I'm sure it was on the level that I bought the car myself. Well, it's true, he did. And he's speaking the truth. But he doesn't know what went on before that. So that's the only thing. It, it, is it, uh, is it true that uh, 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 really all of the uh, professional mechanics uh, shy away from uh, any kind of uh, involvement with magicians or magic? Well, here, here, well, I'll, this is, this is a, a, one of the greatest fallacies in, in, in our connection with gambling and magicians is people, of course, it's a, a few, a fellow told me years ago, if you sell Wallets. We say you sell pocketbooks or wallets, purses to the public. And, and if you if you have them in, inside, perhaps the sales girl looks and says, would you like to have one of these wallets? A person always says, I'd like one, but I got no money to put in it. Now they think this is original. This has been said five million times. I'd buy one if I, if I had the money to put in it. You know, this is, they think they're saying something original where it's been said over and over again. Now the same thing when anybody does any card tricks, even if they spread the cards out like this and turn them over like this, fellow says, boy, I'd hate to play poker with you. This is so trite. I mean, they think they're saying something smart, something original, but they say, boy, I'd hate to play poker with you. Now, as a matter of fact, a real gambler would rather play poker with a, a pretty good magician than anybody else, because he, he's, he's, he's more liable to, to be gullible and taken, because he, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Yeah. And it's, it's as different as classical music and, and, and ragtime, the two arts, because it's brought to a state of refinement, the gambler. He has to do things under the closest scrutiny. He can't make, you know, uh, sudden movements or can't do gyrations of different kinds. It's all got to drop into the conformity or the uniformity of, of card playing or what takes place in a gentleman's game. I mean, it has to be done very well. Whereas a magician can make loud noises, he can tip over a chair, he can stumble, he can do anything. And, and, fits any and cover it, magic, but you can't do this in, in gambling. I mean, it's got to be very subtle. So as I say, the, the magician doesn't realize, see, gamblers have a beautiful word for misdirection. They don't call it misdirection. They call it shade. Yeah, I was going to ask you about yeah, that. Now, you can, you can do the most beautiful move. I don't care what it is, a beautiful pass or maneuver of some kind. Now, you show it to a magician, he'll say, boy, that's great. Gee, that's great. Can you show me that? Can you teach me that? Now, a gambler will look at it. And if he can see the movement or sees it's a little bit off, he changes the moment. At least he doesn't change the yeah. moment. But he'll say, what shade do you use with it? What shade do you use with it? It's important. How do you cover this movement? How do you make it pass muster? He says, what shade do you use with it? Now, this is very, it's a very picturesque word, shade, because that's exactly what it is. It's uh, done under a shadow. It's, it's, in, in other words, the move is good, but how do you use it? Yeah, yeah. How do you use yeah. it? How do you apply it? Yeah. What shade do you use with it? Well, that's, that's, so as I say, the gambler would rather gamble with a magician than anybody else because he knows he can, the magician only knows up to a certain point certain things about the art of deception. Have you known, have you known a few uh, men who were... Uh, no, Herman, Alexander Herman was one of the, he lost a fortune gambling. Alexander Herman. Really? The, the image of the American magician with the beard, the goatee, the man in the picture, the, what's his name, Drew, there. He, he lost a fortune gambling. 
and several magicians, Galli Galli, you know, one uh, contemporary. With the checks. Yeah, lost yeah. a fortune gambling. Really? He has to work in Vegas six weeks to pay his losses every time he works there. But they're all... That's either, pretty in Congress. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, I say, it's a different study. I mean, it's a different yeah. study. Very few, very... Uh, but the strange part of it is the magician who becomes very advanced in his art, with cards particularly, the cards or dice, he gets into the higher flights, which are the gambler's flights, which are used to make a living. This is, uh, they can be applied to magic beautifully, but so, this is a different study. Would it be true then to say that the more rarefied the magician uh, in his work, the closer he comes to the ultimate professional yeah, gambler? Yes, yeah, the gambler's approach. Yeah, the gambler's approach. Yeah, on his Both team. psychologically yeah, and absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. And that's really been... Of course, they, they're, they're uh, divergent. I mean, there's a difference there, but still, this is this is a name. Yeah. But I mean, excluding yeah. the, the, the... Because the proof of it is, when a man has his money invested, and he's got a lot of money invested, and if, if he can be deceived when, under those conditions, whereas doing a trick, well, what's the difference if he catches you or not? It doesn't matter. But when a man's got money invested, he's under you're under close scrutiny. And, You've gotta, you've gotta be, it's got to be perfection almost. Yeah. Well, it must take a, uh, it must take an unbelievable kind of uh, makeup. Oh yes, uh, of to, course uh, it does. To, to, to remain cool. Oh, that's uh, that's, uh, that's what uh, everybody. I mean, uh, I, even if I wanted, I would never have the nerve or the heart to do it. I wouldn't have the audacity to do it. You know, I have. Uh, uh, well, excuse me for interrupting, audacity. but but uh, in one of your uh, writings. Uh, you mentioned, as a, I mentioned, I meant to ask you this earlier. Uh, you mentioned, uh, and it stuck in my mind, that when you were a young fellow, uh, that one of the most difficult things for you to uh, to, to, to 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 achieve was some un was unflinching audacity. Well, no, that's, that, that's that, 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 that I know what I mentioned because yeah. years ago yeah. when I learned to do the cards up the sleeve, that I knew many ways of doing it. But I read in Erdnays, it says slights required, masterly feats of palming an unflinching audacity. Yes. And as a kid, I thought, well, boy, I can get those masterly feats of palming, but this unflinching audacity, I don't think I can attain it. Well, because I remember that. reading about Alexander Herman, who went down with a big bouquet of, of roses to a lady and handed them to her for assisting him, and then somebody said, oh, but you didn't find the ladies, because he found three cards had risen from a houlette. And they said, but you didn't find the ladies' card. He said, well, I give the lady the roses. She said, well, you're not going to find my card. Madam, just pass your hand over the roses, and this card came up from the rose bush, see? But it was all based on a human hair. And it said that, I remember reading, that the nerve that Herman did going down with these fashionable women, and the whole thing rested on this human hair, which was very fragile. If it had broken, nothing... The whole so thing. goes the trick. You've got cards run up so they'll come to yourself on the deal. Those cards are wherever they are. That's the work, because it really, they're going to work down on it, and that's a picturesque word, but that's an old-fashioned word. Now they call it carrying a slot. Carrying a slot. Carrying a slot. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the latest term on Gardena and places like that. They say, well, he carried a slot. It means that in among the cards, are certain cards arranged in a certain place. In a call, though. Yeah, so they, they, you have control of them, so that's called carrying a slot. No, I used to harp. You see, this I, Dr. Yeah, Elliot. But I think that's a fascinating... Yeah, well, Dr. Uh, Elliot, you know, who was a Harvard yeah. graduate, he, he gave up a medical profession and got to follow magic. He yeah, challenged Dr. the world. Elliot. Yeah, he yeah. challenged the world with a deck of cards one time. Five thousand dollar challenge. Was, he, a, was he an incredible performer? Very good. Yeah, to beat anybody in the world, to beat him with an unprepared deck of cards. Now the conditions were they had to do, to do six original things and ten standard things, and you beat anybody in the world. Well, I became very friendly with him, and he, he liked me very much, and we became great friends. But he used to say to me, Vernon, isn't it funny? Magic. He says the art of magic. It's so simple. Two little words. Be natural. Now he meant not only be natural, but in everything. Especially in slights, you have to be natural. You can't do these funny things. And this is not magic. This is, you know, uh, be natural. And not only if you're playing a part, you have to be natural in the part. I mean, you can't be phony. You got to be natural. The magic teaches you to be more observant than the average person. Because I've never trained myself. Like like Huda, I used to take his son around, you know, and they look in the window. You've read that story in the magic books, and you know he'd say. He just walked by his door, and then he asked his son how many objects he saw in the window. And by constant practice, his son, after a time, could walk by a store and describe almost every item in the window. Right? Well, then they had their little second sight. Yeah, that's uh, what uh, they were developing. Yeah, that's what they were developing. Yeah. Yeah. 
But as I say, magic teaches you to be. But I've noticed that so many times. I don't notice. I mean, I don't notice, for instance, the color of somebody's eyes or their hair or whether they're wearing a girl, whether she's got earrings or red shoes or green. But I notice that, that I'm more observant than I often, than other people. I can see. I notice a lot of things they don't notice at all. And I mean, I don't know. As I say, I... And awareness I, to your surroundings, too. And I, I have no... Yeah. I can't analyze art. I don't no. know. I know something about perspective and foreshortening and things. And ordinary knowledge, common knowledge. But, but I know what I like and I know what I feel. And, and but some people, God, they have, they seem to have no, they don't feel art. I mean, they, they see some garish looking, horrible colored photograph, and they say, isn't that beautiful? Boy, if a guy could paint like that, wouldn't that be something? You know? I mean, is, well, I mean, is, I, is magic I, a, uh, is know. magic a matter of timing to you? Well, it is. Is, is, is it a, is it a, a uh, I think it, there are uh, a lot of facets to magic. I think. Uh, 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 it certainly is, uh, uh, hopefully, poetic. Yeah, uh, and, uh, well, I say I try to analyze now, a lot of these fellows. I, I know I've helped. I, I try to help everybody now. Mike Skinner is getting much. He, he took a stage show now. It's remarkable how much he's improved just by working. I mean, at first he looked like a scared. He still looks a little like a scared rabbit. He walks up. When he's doing close-up magic, he's in, he don't notice that. But on the stage, he walks out on the stage, and to me, he looks like a frightened rabbit. <laughs> I mean. He, needs a different opening altogether. But it's hard to convey this to people. They don't see themselves as they are. But I think I'm, well, I always consider my greatest, uh, if I had any great accomplishment of magic, it's Cardini was a kind of a shadow of, but I was the one that, when Cardini first came to New York, he was just a dopey Englishman that did a would, very bad act. Would, would you tell the story, write the story about uh, uh, when you first, when Cardini first met you, I guess, I think you were cutting silhouettes, weren't you? <laughs> that's a but I mean, that's a, uh, well, that's a story that always amused me. Well, that was very funny. Well, I, I had this silhouette story with Larry Gray, the fellow I told you was a great uh, entertainer with cards. And uh, we finally got so, we were so, we'd only go in certain hours of the day when there was a crowd on Broadway. And we'd make enough money to, we pay $300 a bunch for the store. And uh, as long as we had the 300 in, and, the, and then we, uh, once we got that 300 for the size craving, of the month, then we just yeah. work enough to yeah. defray expenses from day to day. We'd a hell of a work. We'd talk magic. So anyway, I thought we got to have a little income coming in while we're not in the store. So we rented uh, part of the store to, to Jack Davis, who was working with Bob Sherman, and put in a magic counter there, a little magic counter, very neat in the corner. But we had to go by the studio and to the back to the magic. And uh, every now and again, Jack Davis would call me. He says he's an amateur magician here from Coppola, Indiana, or from Houston, Texas. He wants to meet you. And I'd walk there, and there'd be, there'd be some guy, will you give me an autograph, Mr. Vernon? And, I, and he didn't know anything about magic at all, you know. So after a time, I said, listen, Jack, don't call me back to meet these people. Don't tell them who I am or anything. I said, unless some fellow's very clever or shows some promise as a magician, I don't want to meet all these people. The hell with Don't call me. So one time he came back and he says, hey, there's an Englishman out here. He says, uh, there's an Englishman. He says, he does, uh, he does, uh, some very nice fans for the car. Well, that's oh, yeah, that's car. right. You have to fan a card uh, uh, for the, well, fan a card for the uh, camera. Uh, well, no, I, anyway, <laughs> hey, I've got some cards here. Uh, I can get them out of my pocket. Well, anyway, he said, uh, this Englishman, he was very blasé, a very typical English. And he said, uh, he said, oh, uh, he said, you're an artist? I said, well, I do magic, too. He said, what do you do with a car? And I said, well, I do anything. He says, can you make it a, a fan? I said, certainly. He says, let me see you make a fan. So, you know, I made a fan. Like and uh, he said, how do you get it all the way around there like that? I said, I don't understand what you mean. He said, well, when I make a fan, he says, I have to do that. Then he says, I finish it with this hand. He says, you do it all with one hand, see, all the way around. I said, well, you just bring it all the way around. And he said, I don't understand that. I said, he said, do you make a blank fan? And I said, yeah, sure, a blank fan. I said, here's a blank fan. I made the blank fan the other way. Of course, these are, these are ornamental cards. I mean, they're, they're chain cards are printed on both sides. Everything he showed me, I was already acquainted with. Three cups and three balls. One there, one there, and one there. Any cup you choose. The center one? All right. You do like that. Whichever side. Which side? Over here? All right. Look. Go on from there. It's over here. 
Now, of course, it wouldn't have made any difference. If you wanted it on this side, I'd do that. We'd come over to this side. Now, I'll show you how the ball will penetrate a cup. We'll put it on top there. We say down, goes right through. So we have three balls, three cups. Oh, there it is, went right down there. Boom. Two balls, two cups. I don't want you to think, there are only two there. Two balls, two cups. Last one. Go. <laughs> now I'll show you once more, I'm going to show you how to cover them over. I'll do this in slow motion. Some people think it has to be done quickly. One under each cup. One, two, three. Now, if I put this one back in my pocket, and I put this back in my pocket, it should be easy enough to follow that there's still one here. But this one has come back. Now, the reason for that is this. I pretend to put it here. I keep it here. I pretend to put it in my pocket. I bring it with a little finger and put it behind the cup. See, it's not really there at all. But if I actually put it in my pocket, how many are there? Most people guess they're wrong because you see there's three there. One, two, three. Now, if I put all three away, if there's one under there, I must use a fourth one. I do use a fourth one. There's the fourth one, see? Then sometimes one of these come here, sometimes one comes here, and sometimes one like that. So that's the old Egyptian trick. This trick, uh, you see, of course, has been handed generation after generation have done this trick, and every performer, this is like uh, rendering the classic. It's a classic, and magic has its classics, just like music or painting and everything. There. And as I say, and you can't very well go wrong with the classics, but there are many ways to interpret the classics. Uh, uh, and of course, there are classics in reference to uh, card technology, too. Oh, right? yes, I yes, mean, uh, certainly, yes. Uh, uh, a, uh, a couple dozen basic moves, yeah, probably. Yeah, they live. Uh, the, the real classic persists. The others come and go. Fads yes, come and yeah, go, but the yeah. classics stay... Uh, in breaking down, uh, in breaking down uh, basic... Uh, uh, a card uh, 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 moves uh, die. Uh, what would you would you put it into a dozen basic uh, moves, or how how, well, how, how would you how would you uh, frame that? Well, they say I know I've known performers who only knew uh, I, I might say five basic slights. We call we call slights being yes. maneuvers that are secret maneuvers, and with five secret maneuvers like a change and a shift and a, and different maneuvers that are used in the magic. And if with five, you can do a very creditable performance, you know. You don't need too many. It's a great mistake to get cluttered up with too many. That's my trouble. I get, I, I like everything, and I keep... But you should stick to the... You should master the basics to get them down. Just like certain things in painting or sculpture, they have to... Yeah. Fundamentals have to be right. Yeah. And after that, you can explore yeah. a few different things. You know, people often say... How do you do these tricks? How do you do card tricks? Which, well, very few people, very magicians aren't honest people. I'm going to be perfectly honest and show you how the sleeve is used to do tricks. For that purpose, I'm going to use ten cards, which I have already counted off. That's two, three, four, five, six, that's seven, eight, nine, and one make ten. Now with these ten cards, I'm going to hold them at arm's length, have them go up my sleeve, cross my body under my jacket, down into this pocket. And I assure you, I don't wear any trick clothing of any kind. That's a long way for the cards to go, and if you want to see them go, you'll have to watch very closely. I'll hold them in full view where you can see everything. And a little, oh, I'm a little clumsy there. I dropped those to show there are no strings on them or anything. I went out of sight. <laughs> go. You hear that click? That sends a card up the sleeve into the pocket. Now watch the second card go. It's funny, sometimes hot weather, they stick at the elbow. <laughs> card number two. Now when I dropped those cards, perhaps you thought I had a motive and I hid certain cards down there. But I assure you, there are no cards on the floor. Two have passed, I should have eight left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cards left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now watch the eight cards, see if you can't see how they go up to sleep. Now watch this very closely. I just do this, see, like that. You say that's a pretty clumsy move, but you can't tell. I just want to see if you're watching that time. I passed it down to this pocket, you see? <laughs> so that had to use one, two, three, four, five, six cards. Now I'm going to try a very difficult maneuver to pass two at once. One, two. Two clicks like that, 
two cards. I had six a moment ago, I now have only four. Now to prove that these four actually go up the sleeve, I've got to try and stop one at my armhole this time as it goes across, watch. Shake like that and reach in there and get it. That leaves <laughs> just the three cards in the hand. Now when you come down to the last three, you keep them perfectly squared up. That's the whole secret of the trick, to keep the cards perfectly squared up like that. Little shake, reach in here, you get a card. Another shake, another card. Leaves a single card in the hand. Now, if you were to walk behind and you'd see what happens, the card starts to travel along that way. Now, if you push it too hard, it slips out of sight, see, where you can't see it up there like that. But if you put it in the hand like that, remember the card, the ace of clubs, you just lay it in the hand like that, and you wiggle your thumb like, you see the card runs right along, comes right out like that. And that's the way it works. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. You know, it's very seldom a magician does a trick twice, but I'm going to give you a chance to see how this trick is done. This is a trick with, with coins. Now, these coins are from Australia. These are half crowns worth about 50 cents. I have eight of them, eight coins. I want you to observe, observe very closely what I do. There's my own signet ring, my own signet ring, and four coins. And this hand, four coins. Now, you've got to remember, this hand has the four coins alone, and this has the four coins with the signet ring. Now, the signet ring is in the right hand, remember, in the right hand. Hold both hands apart like this. One hand goes under the table. You see all the coins go through. Now, I know most people say, well, there was some cheating went on there somewhere. I'll do this again, because I want you to see that this is fair and above board. There's the ring. And I take four coins. In that hand, four and in. Now, everybody knows it's impossible to go bang and have them all come in this hand, unless in some way, before I start the trick, I get coins from hand to hand. Now, I want you to be sure that I do no such thing. There are only four coins there, nothing up my sleeve, nothing else, just the four coins. And in this other hand, I have nothing but the four coins and the ring, nothing else in the hand, nothing up the sleeve. Now, the hands do not come together. I hold them wide apart like this. This hand goes under the table. Get it here, this is a pretty thick table. Up, go. And now, that's about all there is to it. There's a hole in the table, but you can't see it from where you're sitting. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Can you see the cards? All right. Now, see the Ace of Spades has the advertising mark on it bicycle and so on. The red cards don't have printing like that. Now by a simple maneuver like this, turning the card like that, you see one of these aces, the ace of hearts, turns face up. Now by a faster move like that, that turns the ace of hearts down and the ace of clubs turns face up. Now the diamond, you have to turn very slowly. Then the diamond will turn over, you see. Now of course, the spade being a little heavier than the others, you can turn these cards as much as you like. Nothing will happen to the spade at all because the cards will stay face down. But if you just tap it in the center like that, you see that ace of spades turns over. Now, look, I'll put those aces on top of the pack like this, and I'll cut the cards. Now, you imagine you're playing in a card game. These cards are shuffled and cut. If you want to, you can give them a triple cut like this. Now I'll do this again, watch. I'll shuffle the cards like this. Cut. The aces always stay on the top. Now I'll show you. You take these cards this way, four aces. Put them back on the top again. Now this time, I'm going to take the cards, half of them face up and half of them face down. I'm going to shuffle them in like this. So half of them are shuffled in face up and half face down. Like this. You see the way they are? Half are shuffled up and half down. Now do this very slowly. Watch this as close as you can. Some of them are face up, some of them are face down. They're all mixed up. But with one maneuver like this. Well, wait a minute. You sure see back to back, face to face. With one slap. They all straighten up, with the exception of the four aces, which are one, two, three. More. That's, That's all there is to that. That's beautiful. <laughs>
take my word, there's only one ace of spades in this pack, the ace of spades. Now if I take this ace of spades like this and put it under the top card, you can see it under the top card there, but it's not, it's on top. Now look, I'll do that again. There's the ace of spades, see? Only one card, the only ace of spades. Now I'm going to put it under the top card. And you see there are no double lifts or any of that so-called trick. It still comes to top. Now I'll do that again. Put the ace of spades underneath the top card. There's the ace of spades underneath there. I just do that and I say come up and the ace of spades comes right to top again. A lot of people don't believe that a card can come up that way. Now look, I'll put it in face up in the pack. There it is. Now watch the side. The camera can watch from the side. See if you see that ace jump up. Look, watch. One, two, three. See? I did that slowly. <laughs> now I'll do it fast. Watch. One, two, oh, that was slow. I, I gotta speed up. One, two, three. See, it jumps right to the top. Now that can be, when the card is face down, it's impossible to see the action. Watch. The action cannot be seen. That's called the quickness of the hand deceives the eye. <laughs>